Okay, it's going to be a review of WWF's Over the Edge, 1998. Um, a lot of firsts here. The, the very first time they, they tried this Over the Edge uh, format. It, it would have been interesting to see if the Over the Edge series would have continued if it wasn't for the Owen Hart uh, situation. I, honestly, I'm really not crazy about this title, um, but you get where it came from. You know, Austin was pushing McMahon over the edge. You, Maybe you could, uh, you know, buy into that uh, little title there. But, you know, th this is kind of uh, interesting. This is this is the first uh, pay-per-view to be titled uh, TV 14. And uh, every pay-per-view would be um, have these parental guidelines all the way up until Great American Bash 2008, SummerSlam 2008. Those are the first uh, PG uh, pay-per-views. So uh, that's pretty interesting. But um, yeah, this is technically an in-your-house. But at this time, I don't know. I wish they would have just dropped the title here. Um, so it's over the edge, in your house. Uh, but it's the first May pay-per-view to be three hours. Uh, so going all the way back to May 31st, 1998 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is where the uh, Austin 316 was born at the King of the Ring 1996. Same venue, same arena. So that that's really interesting. Um, the attendance is 9,822. Um, much better gate than the uh, previous May pay-per-views. They, they almost did about 100,000 in merchandise. Uh, the pay-per-view buy rate is 203,000 buys, which, you know, that that's actually a lot lower than the previous pay-per-view, which which was unforgiven, but it, it still blows away uh, 96 and 97. So it, it's it's almost 70 to uh, to uh, 100,000 more than 96 and 97's, uh, you know, May pay-per-views. But, but yeah, let, let's get right down to it. Um, the, the poster has Ken Shamrock on it. I'll tell you, man, the, this pay-per-view really could have used Ken Shamrock uh, as he's given the ankle lock to Billy Gunn. It says, promotional poster featuring Ken Shamrock and Billy Gunn, even though Billy Gunn is just taking the move right there. Um, yeah, no Shamrock on the show. So, um, But, hey, he did win King of the Ring, the very next pay-per-view. Um, I got to say, this is an awful show. Uh, a great main event. I would definitely say the main event is uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin's um, match of the year for 1998. And it's funny, like, you know, my brother loves the Shawn Michaels match and the Shawn match. It, it You know, people, you know, talk about that finish and the Tyson stuff uh, to death. Um, but it's funny, like, that's, you know, th this is probably the better match. Uh, and it's funny, like, the, the other thing is you got, you know, they finally overtook WCW in the ratings. You know, obviously the Austin babyface turn worked and, you know, giving him the title. And, you know, they, they did the, the Vince McMahon uh, arm wrestling match with, where they finally beat Nitro. So the tide is definitely turning here. They're, they're winning the ratings. Uh, Nitro's being preempted because of the NBA playoffs. So they're really kind of digging away at this time with merchandise and, and, and ratings. And, and it's funny, like... You know, you look at the main event here. It's two guys that Bischoff, you know, hang high and dry, as Austin would say. You know, the two guys that WCW, um, you know, just kind of let go of and, and made their way to ECW. And you got Stone Cold Steve Austin and Foley in the main event uh, of a pay-per-view uh, back-to-back. And it, it's, it, it really would have been interesting to see Austin versus uh, uh, Foley in the Hell in a Cell, which was the original plan. Um you know, it, it all worked out, but it, like I, I think, you know, the, the do love character wouldn't have worked in a Hell in a Cell. And if 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 I think if every I think everybody would agree with this. Like, if you had your pick between Mick Foley and Austin, like what what character should Foley play? Yeah, Cactus Jack versus Austin would have been tremendous. But I think Cactus Jack is just so rebellious and so you know, hardcore that, you know, maybe you run the risk of some of the fans, you know, turning on Austin and siding with, uh, you know, Cactus. So, uh, but yeah, that would have been really cool if the Hell in a Cell would have been Austin versus Cactus Jack, but uh, ended up being Kane, which, you know, ultimately, I, I think that was the right call. I actually like the uh, the first blood match with Kane uh, at King of the Ring. Um, but uh, but let's 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 get right down to it. First first match tonight, awful undercard right here. Uh, dreadful stuff. It, it, it's more about character development and storylines and actual wrestling. Uh, so you got the LOD 2000 Animal and Hawk uh, coming out there with Darren Drozdov and uh, Sonny. Sonny's actually uh, uh, sporting the Legion of Doom attire and uh, they're taking on the Disciples of Apocalypse, who I'm, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, the match kind of sucked. I mean, this is LOD past the prime. I, I think giving them Sonny 
I definitely think it gave them a shot of life. Uh, Draws gives them the assist, and the LOD actually wins this thing with the scoop slam. But uh, yeah, this this did not last much longer. I, I believe LOD. This is one of their last pay per view matches, maybe their last. And, and I think Sunny actually. She she was at Heat Wave ninety eight with Chris Candido, so she must have uh, went to ECW very quickly after this. Um, you know, you know, I, I gotta say that the crowd was hot for LOD. It, it had uh, a, a nice little atmosphere, um, but the the match was just nasty to watch. Really, really nasty. Uh, next up, we have Jeff Jarrett coming out there with Tennessee Lee uh, to take on uh, Steve Blackman. Um, I, I really tried to get into this thing. I, I actually like Jarrett and, and Blackman. Uh, Jared got a lot of criticism here for not being over as a heel uh, and the fans just not being into him. Uh, so so definitely, like when you look at the early 97, 98 Jeff Jarrett return, he really got a lot better, I think, over the summertime. I, I think SummerSlam 98 going into, you know, the, the end of, uh, you know, No Mercy 99 when he did the stuff with China. I think he really transformed himself and really morphed his character. Uh, at this point, he, he, he definitely struggled. I, I thought this would be a good match. And it, it it seemed like Blackman had the fans behind him, but the longer this went on, it's like the fans lost interest by like every second, every minute. I, I like the Tennessee Lee dude. I, I, I really do. You know, Jarrett's from uh, Tennessee. Uh, Quentin Tarantino's from Tennessee as well. And this really reminded me of some of the guys that he used in the Dust to Dawn movies and, and the, uh, the Kill Bill movies. I forget the name of the actor. I think it's My- Michael Parks. I could be wrong. You know, the, 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 the guy that showed up at the scene of the murder at, at Kill Bill, he reminded me so much of that guy. Uh, so we had Tennessee written all over him. All right, next we have Mark Merrow taking on Sable. Uh, pretty interesting match right here. It's only 30 seconds. It's a nice little swerve. Uh, but, you know, he dropped the wild man gimmick at this point. I, I just think the the wild man gimmick, um, I could see why Vince thought it was going to be successful. And I just think the timing was just bad. But, you know, apparently Vince really like was stubborn that that this wild man gimmick w- was really going to work but then eventually mark merrill kind of morphed into the uh boxer um g- very interesting promo with sable and it kind of got me thinking about relationships in pro wrestling i, I think at that time in the late 90s they-, they were very equivalent to i think what was going on in the adult film in- industry um you know you have several um you know female porn stars that would date male porn stars and a lot of them would end up getting married and they would actually think that the marriage is going to work and they would never work. Uh, you know, it's just very, very difficult to make those work. I, I think the same thing could be said in, in pro wrestling in the late 80s, early 90s with, uh, you know, like Savage and Elizabeth and, you know, Sable and Mark Merrow. Obviously, this ran its course storyline wise and uh, eventually Sable, uh, you know, left Mark Merrow. Um, as well but I, I just think both industries right now they're probably it's probably a lot more healthy uh to have a relationship in pro wrestling and you know whatever you know you know entertainment business you want to throw in there it's 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 probably not as challenging as it was uh back in the day um but hey you know mark Merrow talked about how this business destroys relationships and um you know said you know where did we go wrong and you know he was actually going to lie down for Sable, and Sable actually bought it. And uh, Mero actually flipped it and uh, small package Sable. And I, I don't know, S- Sable did not look good here, um, you know, from a character standpoint. I just I just thought her acting was pretty bad. And, I, you know, I remember Vince actually brought her back uh, at King of the Ring. But, um, you know, S- S- Sable definitely transformed her body here, and she definitely got some... I don't know what she did to her face, but if you look at her face at... Um, you know, some of the pay-per-views of 96. She just looks so much more innocent uh, back at that time. She she looks a lot hard, more hardened uh, around this time for whatever the reason. So, but, you know, but you could definitely see, like, Sable's popularity was was about to explode uh, that summer, no doubt about it. All right, next up we have Kai and Tai of uh, Dick Togo, um, Funaki, uh, Men's Taiho. That's the dude wearing the jeans and the crappy ring attire. And they're taking on uh, Bradshaw, JBL, Justin Bradshaw, and Taco Michinoko in a handicap match. Right here. I, I thought this was fun. This was definitely the highlight of the undercard. Um, you know, Bradshaw and Taka, it, it's almost like a... Um, it's almost like the, the the kid that drinks a lot at school takes the young innocent kid under his wing, uh, but Bradshaw just looked like a beast and dominant uh, here. I thought Dick Togo looked great. <laughs> One of my favorite YouTube comments ever was uh, someone actually 
rated a Young Bucks match higher than a Dick Togo match at a PWG show. And I think it was Sean Carlton Zero. He was like a huge like Japanese uh, wrestling reviewer. And he, <laughs> he said, it's hard to imagine that uh, the Young Bucks outperformed Dick Togo. So you got to see uh, Dick Togo on this show. But man, I thought the match was fun, man. Taka was great. And I, I got to say, Brad, Bradshaw looked like he had a lot of potential back then. He looked young. He looked... Uh, like a stud, man. You know, the J, um, Jr. And, and Jerry were even talking about his uh, NFL background, and you know, it, it was a huge star at uh, Texas uh, as a college football player. So you could definitely see the ability here. I just thought the match had a lot of uh, energy to it. You, you could make the argument that it felt like a mess. You know, some of the ring attire by some of the kind tie guys was was a little bit weird. But um, it, it, the, the bottom line is, it was it was entertaining, no doubt about it. Uh, next up, we have The Rock taking on Farouk. So they, they do an angle where Rock actually gets uh, uh, power drove uh, by Farouk, and uh, he has to put a neck brace on. This is like the biggest chicken shit heel performance of The Rock the whole night. He's trying to weasel out of the match. He's wearing the neck brace. So totally the opposite of the uh, the real-life Austin uh, Owen Hart situation, where Austin's trying to show toughness and doesn't want to get on the stretcher. Here, The Rock's just trying to weasel out of uh, defending the Intercontinental Championship. But I got to say, man, the, the, this might have been one of the first pay-per-views where you saw the brand-new look uh, for the IC title, where they, they make it a little bit more slimmer. I actually like that belt a lot better than the old school belt. I'm probably in the minority there, but uh, but I got to say though, Farouk was not over. You know, you would think the, the the fans would have gotten behind Farouk because they started turning on the Rock. I just think the fans were more anti Rock, and you know, they they just loved to hate this version of the Rock, but. It's really not like the fans really got behind Farouk. You know, I, I don't know what it is. Lack of charisma. And may, maybe they're still, you know, a little bit cold to that Farouk Assad character when he first came in. You know, that, that character got a lot of heat. But it, it just didn't seem like the fans gave a shit uh, about Farouk. It was all about them just hating The Rock. But it was good storyline progression for The Rock. Good character development. Uh, he, he really did come across like like a chicken shit heel. But but at the same time, I, th I think Rock still, you know, had a ways to go. I, I, I think I think you wanted he, he just needed more of a blend of seriousness. And I think you definitely got that during the summertime. But they, they just they put this feud to rest right here. And, uh, you know, Rock goes over in about five minutes with the foot on the rope. There was a botched uh, rope break here by the referee. It was just nasty. It was ugly. Th this is one of the weakest matches I think The Rock ever had on pay-per-view. But it didn't go too long. And, you know, it, it really it really wasn't about the wrestling. But I, I got to say, Farouk's uh, babyface push, it, it, it's, it's probably going to you know, go down as a big disappointment when you look back on it. Uh, I think the Ron Simmons damn thing, uh, I, th I think that really helped him out, you know, once he got away from, uh, you know, Farouk right here. Uh, next up, we got Kane uh, taking on Vader. This is a mass versus mass match. Um, kind of disappointed, but I, I actually do like the combination. This is a rematch from No Way Out, uh, 1998, where, where Va I believe Vader actually got beat by Kane um, with the screwdriver, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm sort of surprised at how down uh, the WWE uh, management was down on Vader. Uh, they just thought he was lazy. They thought he was fat. They thought he was blown up at this time. They just said we didn't get the Vader from WCW. We didn't get the Vader from Japan. Like so, so there's this mentality that they totally botched uh, the Vader push, but they just get, didn't get behind him here. Um, but I, I I like the idea of Kane. And Vader uh, together. I, I I think Vader could have done a lot for Kane. Their their previous match is a lot uh, better. I think Vader was definitely working through some injuries here. He was definitely a little bit overweight. Uh, but the bottom line is, after uh, Vader misses a moonsault, Kane actually puts him away with a pile driver. Probably one of the biggest guys Kane ever got up for the pile driver. And um, that's pretty much it. Paul Bear actually puts on the Vader mask. Vader on mass, and he actually calls himself a fat piece of shit. And, uh, yeah, it really was interesting to see Vader's, uh, you know, how down he was on himself. So th this was pretty much it, you know, phasing out Vader, you know, pretty much phasing out Farouk as well. So um, so there we go with that. So, yeah, th this this was an awful undercard so far. I, I actually like the six-man tag match. So we get the Nation of Domination of uh, D'Lo Brown, Kama Mustafa, who's actually the godfather, and Owen Hart. Um Taking on D Generation X, uh, Billy Gunn, Road Dog, and China. We got 
I'm sorry, Billy Gunn, Road Dog, and Triple H. We got China and X Pac out there uh, at ringside, uh, as well as Mark Henry. So th there's a lot of combustible elements here. Uh, th the match got a little bit of boring chance. Um, it it's an old school tag match. It's something that could have been on Raw, uh, but but I really liked it though. I think this was good for Owen Hart. Um, you know, the the Owen and Sean stuff. Yeah, I mean, obviously that could have been better, but um, you know, th there was a really interesting promo that Sean cut on Owen when he kept on attacking him after the screw job he's like just when you thought you flushed that big piece of shit down the toilet there's just that little nugget that won't go down so he, he was referring to owen hart as the little nugget and um i think after a while once that owen and sean stuff just kind of ran its course they just turned owen heel and he joined the nation of domination and uh you know degeneration x had turned babyface you know they they invaded wcw with with the tanks and, uh, you know, they invaded the Turner offices. So they're coming off of that high. So this is this is a big match for Triple H. This is this is probably his you know first or second match as a baby face. So it was interesting to see the dynamic between Owen uh, and Triple H change. So Owen actually beats Triple H with the pedigree here. Uh, it was crazy, man. But, um, you know, big win for Owen. You know, I, I actually liked uh, this Nation of Domination push right here. But it was good, man. I, I thought it was solid stuff. It's a nice little old school tag match. Is Did they go a little bit too long? Yeah, but I thought Billy Gunn looked good. Road Dog actually busted out a really, really awesome pile driver on, um, on D'Lo Brown. You know, I thought that might have been the finish. I thought D'Lo looked good. You know, Owen... Owen and Triple H did some good stuff, but I don't know. It it, it looked a little bit weird. Uh, it's just it's just weird seeing Triple H uh, as a babyface at this time. But um, but good match right here. I, I thought this was definitely you know a lot better than everything else on the show. But uh, you you could make the argument that it was very very slow paced, and you know you know maybe 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 they could maybe they could have cut this thing down a, a little bit. But you know for a pay per view, I I thought it was fine. I, I thought it was dope stuff. So huge win for Owen and the uh, Nation of Domination. Uh, and then we move on from there. Next up we have the main event we got stone cold steve austin taking on dude love for the uh, uh wwf champion this ended up being a falls count anywhere match uh for the title they kept on changing the rules as this match went, went on you got vince mcmahon in a very tight referee shirt where he's showing off his muscles we got pat patterson as a special guest ring announcer we got gerald briscoe as a special guest timekeeper and then we got the undertaker as the special enforcer so it's one of the interesting things, you know, there's a backstage rumor that Undertaker was like a backstage enforcer to make sure Shawn Michaels dropped the belt to Austin. So that real life situation kind of took on a life of its own here as, uh, you know, Taker, you know, kind of was the neutralizer here. And, you know, chokeslam Pat Patterson, Gerald Briscoe through the announce tables, um, you know, anytime they interfered in this match. So that that was really, really cool. And it's almost like Taker. I hate to say this, and maybe, maybe this, maybe some people would disagree with me, but I think Taker is like one of the biggest fans of Austin. I, I think he saw that Austin was going to make everybody more money. I, I think he was really attracted to the gimmick, it, and it's almost like Taker bit a lot of Austin's gimmick with the American badass uh, stuff. And even when Taker turned heel, like you watched that Vengeance 2001 match against RVD, he took some of the mannerisms that Austin did as a heel, some of those the funny stuff like you know acting like you're drunk during the match so i i think taker was very influenced uh by austin uh you know during the attitude era like uh, no doubt about it but uh not to take away from this match right here th this this is an awesome match uh it's the best dude love match ever i think foley said this is the only time you'll see uh dude love pop up in any best of compilation so you know it, w what's really cool when you look at some of those compilations back in the day um you know they let like jericho austin and, and foley they let them select their matches. And I, th I think both Austin and Foley uh, select this as one of their best matches. So I, I would definitely say this is a, a top three match of 1998. Uh, I would actually put the Hell in a Cell with Taker and Mankind as number one. But you know, this would be a solid number two. And uh, yeah, definitely Austin's best match of 1998, which kind of goes um, 
under the radar. I think it's a huge step up from the Unforgiven match. I just think you had an incredible reaction uh, for Austin. Some people have argued that this is the biggest pop Austin ever got uh, for a pay-per-view match, at least. Um, you know, when he's when he's scheduled to wrestle on a pay-per-view. I know the Backlash 2000 gets brought up and, you know, the, the, the Foley uh, championship win gets brought up time and time again. I think there's another pop right before St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Toronto that people uh, loved as well. But th this will definitely be up there as, as an Austin uh, pop. I just think he had so much momentum, the celebrity death match, the, the ratings, you know, winning the war, you know, the, the tide started turning in 1998. I mean, he was like Mr. 1998, along with a lot of other guys. But uh, th this this was Austin just as a machine. I, I think Foley um, in the storyline right here. I mean, I, I got to talk about the storyline a little bit. Th this is the you know, kind of the early stages of the McMahon Austin uh, rivalry, um, where he wanted Austin to sell out, and um, you know Foley's the one that really sold out. And you know the dude, the, the dude love character more so than uh, Cactus Jack and Mankind. You could really, you know, sprinkle in a lot of uh, variation with it, with with the long hair, the fake smile, uh, the haircut, you know, the corporate suits. It, it really kind of, you know, it, it was it was a sign of uh, selling out with with, with Foley here. Um, there was a really, really good... All right, so a lot of people love that Terry Funk match on Raw uh, where, where he's Mick Foley. So Foley said that he wasn't going to ever go back to being the dude love character. But since he won the number one contendership, I think Vince kind of... Um, you know, gave him mo a motivational speech to, you know, transform back into the uh, dude love character. And uh, obviously a lot of this stuff probably hasn't aged well. You've seen Austin get handcuffed and you saw Austin actually get Vince arrested after he got attacked by Vince. And, you know, he, he forces Vince to give an apology right in front of the cops. So a lot of this stuff was really, really oversaturated over the Attitude Era. And even with like Goldberg as well with the handcuff stuff. So... Uh, but it was cool, though. I think at that time it was refreshing. I, I, th I think at this time everybody wanted to get a piece of the Montreal screw job with Vince being the special guest referee. It just had so much natural realism to it that you had to follow up on it. And obviously, like when you when you watch it back today, it feels like we've seen it so many times with you know recycled but uh at the time i think it was just fresh but they had amazing chemistry though man i, th I thought dude uh foley you know like he, he just he bumped really really well for austin here anytime austin made a comeback the fans were just really reacting to every single punch every single clothesline the, the only thing that really didn't get a reaction was the false teeth like I, I think austin uh you know the, the teeth actually fell out and austin actually stomped them and uh it just didn't get a reaction it's just it, i guess it was just tough to see the uh the fake teeth but and and, and uh, jr actually said or it was jerry lawler that actually said uh do love has lost a smile and then jim ross was like lost a smile what do you mean by that yeah, i don't know i don't know if it was a shot of Shawn michaels or what but but yeah, man, I, I got to say, some of these bumps that Foley took, that that one clothesline off the guardrail it was crazy. It, it was, he landed flat on the concrete. If if Foley didn't over, you know, rotate properly, you know, he would have been paralyzed uh, on that spot. And uh, I, I got to say, man, Pat Patterson was great. So so when they started using the weapons and they started going all over the place, Pat Patterson was like, now this match is a no disqualification. And then Jim Ross was great. He was like, since when? Since when? So I got to say, Pat Patterson is totally old school. Uh, I, I could He definitely came across really really entertaining here even as the, the ring announcer like before the match he's like he's like screw it when he's talking about austin he's like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna introduce a bum so uh so yeah bottom line is pat patterson was you know he he might have been one of the more entertaining things about this match but it was pretty damn good man e even like you know the false cat anywhere stuff a lot of the stuff that they did by the car uh, I think Gerald Briscoe had, um, you know, he was promoting the Briscoe Brothers uh, body shop. They had the phone number right by some of the cars. And they, they did some great stuff. Austin took some really, really questionable bumps, like with the neck. You could tell, you could tell, like there was a lot of hesitancy when Foley did that neck breaker uh, in the aisle. Like you could just tell he didn't want to take it. There was a backdrop, several backdrops from the pile driver uh, where Austin actually goes landing into the car. So. It's pretty damn wild, man. Um, in terms of Vince's performance here, 
pretty damn good. I, I thought he sold it well. Great facial expressions. Uh, a, a lot of the times were were awesome on him to make the uh, the pinfall. You could just tell like Vince Vince sold it really really well that he he didn't want Austin to become champion. So uh, I think everybody just hit a home run here. I thought Taker played his role great. I thought Austin, you know, played a great baby face with the blood. And, uh, you know, just the, the comeback, <laughs> what was the line? Jerry Lawler was good too, man. You know, you could argue that this is prime Jim Ross and that, that this blood's for you when the blood started flowing out of Austin. I thought I thought that was great. But I got to say, man, Fo Foley is an underrated wrestler, man. I, I just thought you got a lot of, a little bit of everything here from him. Like just from chain wrestling to headlocks to bumping to sunset flips. The, the sunset flip off the uh, car, it's a false cut anywhere, Matt. So that was actually a near fall. That was pretty cool as well. So that, that you know, I, I was really, really impressed with Foley here. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the endings to these Unforgiven and Over the Edge uh, main events, not crazy about them. But, uh, you know, obviously Austin, uh, you know, countered the mandible claw into the stunner. Uh, Vince actually took an unprotected chair shot from Foley. Foley took an un unprotected chair shot and then... He tried to give him one to Austin. Austin ducks out of the way, and then Vince takes a nasty-looking uh, unprotected chair shot, which I'm sure is fucking him up, fucking him up to this very day. And uh, so, on the final stunner, uh, Do Love actually takes two stunners, but on the final stunner, Austin has to take Vince's hand and slam it against the mat. And uh, I think Undertaker actually rings for the, you know, signals for the bell to ring and. That's the finish right there. Not crazy about it. I, it's, it's a little bit more satisfying than the previous match. I think the previous match, Austin just counted by himself. And so in this match, it's actually Vince that makes the count. But I, I, I think Foley brought this to everybody's attention. There was a promo where Vince said, when my hand hits the mat and counts to three, you know, I'm going to I'm going to award a new champion. So he did say when my hand hits the mat and as long as his hand hits the mat, that's all that really counts. So uh, it's a pretty damn good main event. You know, I, th I think if, if, if you want to find the Austin match from 1998 that really uh, exemplifies how over he was and how, uh, you know, heated, you know, the, the rivalry was and, and, you know, Foley just stepping in and just being very multidimensional, I think all three of these characters mankind cactus jack do love uh they're all very different but for this situation right here do love was the perfect person to put in that sellout role and uh yeah I, I think even austin said you know when when you take the uh when when you get a haircut and you shave you're pretty you're actually a pretty damn good looking guy and that foley's like yeah 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 so you know i, I don't think i you know when, when foley cleans himself up he's he's not like the um He's not the worst looking guy in the world. Like sometimes uh, they presented him to be uh, as mankind. So, um, yeah, really, really interesting main event. The, the the undercard here is dreadful, dreadful undercard. Just stay away from it. Um, you know, in 1998, you know, I, I just think a lot of they really hadn't find, found their groove yet. I think during the summertime, King of the Ring and SummerSlam, you know, the, those are much more well-rounded. Uh, pay-per-views but you know I'll wrap it up right here that's over the edge 1998 um hope you guys enjoyed the review and i'm out all right